Hello and welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. This is Ensuring Success and we are live in Dallas at AMS Pictures. I'm Gail Perry, Editor-in-Chief of CPA Practice Advisor Magazine. And I apologize for you, uh, for those of you who um, expected this session to start a little bit earlier, but better late than never. Um, this is the beauty of live broadcasting. We had a little bit of te technical difficulty earlier this morning. We're past that now. We're certain everything's going to be smooth sailing from now on. So we will still keep these sessions at 50 minutes, which is why we've still got the lag. Uh, we're probably going to carry it through most of the day because we need to be able to offer CPE credit. And in this case, C CE credit for this session as well. So um, anyone who's looking for any kind of credit, be sure to stay tuned with us for this session. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our sponsors who are making this event possible. So they are Avalara, Sage, BQE Core, eFileforbiz.com, Paytex, CPA.com, ADP, Zero, Chase Inc., Walters Kluwer, Gusto, Canopy and Intuit. And in particular, Intuit is sponsoring this session. So we're particularly happy to have uh, Intuit representative here as well as the company supporting our presentation of this session. Um, and just a quick shout out, I haven't done this yet today and I apologize, but a shout out to managing editor Isaac O'Bannon who's managing our social media from uh, behind the scenes. So hey, Isaac. So, um, before we get started, I'll just explain briefly for those of you who have just joined us that the way to get CPE credit is that we will give out three codes during the session. Uh, each code is something you want to write down, and at the end of the session you'll have all three codes, and you'll put those all together at the end of the day, and click on the CPE slash CE tab at the top of the screen, and that'll take you to a form where you can enter those codes. Uh, and if you're looking for CE credit, you'll enter your P10 number there. And then that's what you need to do to verify your attendance for this session and receive your CPE and CE credit. So that's how that works. If you have any questions, you can reach us at info at insuringsuccess.com, info at insuringsuccess.com. And also our hashtag is December CPE. So feel free to talk about us on social media. So today, I am joined by Marty McCutcheon and Jackie Meyer and Jim Buffington, and I'm going to have them briefly introduce themselves to you before we start talking about tax tips. Yeah, I'm, I'm Marty McCutcheon. I have a CPA firm in Fort Worth, Texas, and we focus on tax and profit planning. Hi, I'm Jackie Meyer. Um, hi, <laughs> I'm Jackie Meyer. And um, I have a firm in South Lake, Texas called Meyer Tax, the concierge CPA, and I'm also a business coach for other accounting firm owners. And I'm Jim Buffington. I'm with Intuit here in Plano, Texas, and I lead our advisory services and our Intuit Tax Council, which is representative of uh, customers across the country that help influence our senior leader decisions. Excellent. So we have people here who are very immersed in tax planning, and uh, as a result, we'd like to hear from them about some great tips that you can implement in your practice, that things you may not have considered. Um, there's a situation, I think, with tax accountants in general where we tend to provide planning advice as part of our tax preparation process. And um, traditionally, uh, we all started as tax practitioners and found ourselves looking at clients' tax returns and looking at their documents and their situation and saying, hey, you know, you should think about doing this, or have you done this, or too bad you didn't tell me about the fact that you were going to do that. But, um, but the things we would talk about were sort of add-ons to the tax preparation process instead of actually something that we thought of charging and presenting as a separate service in our firm. Well. Um, the people here on this panel know what it's like to go beyond that and, uh, and really uh, perform tax planning services in a big way for their clients. So um, what we'd like to talk about today is the kinds of tips that are useful to clients. But before we even do that, let's talk a little bit about what, um, what you talk about when you meet with a client, how you even get the conversation started to move it in the direction of tax planning. Um, Marty, you want to kick this yeah. off? So, um, you know, you just had the conversation about, how, you know, you deliver the tax return. That's the easiest time to do it. And then 
Um, you're saying, okay, you owe this tax, but hey, if you do some proactive planning, there are some things you can do that can minimize this tax burden that you have. And having that conversation, usually people are, hey, if you're going to save me money, let's talk. And then if they are a good quality client that understands that if you're going to provide a service, there's a value to that service, then you can start the, start the conversation and introduce the tax planning engagement. But a lot of times you have people in your client base that don't understand it. Okay, well, then just start focusing on the ones that you're not going to keep all the clients if you do this, but you'll keep most of them. And your revenues will go up and you'll work less. So good deal. Yeah, there's always going to be people that don't get the value proposition, right? And that's okay because it can't be for everybody. But um, for, for those that can, we actually do tax strategies for every single 100% of our clients in our firm, which is a rarity I found in our industry. Um, and so when I'm having that conversation with a client, I actually tell them I'm probably going to be the most expensive accountant you've ever hired, but I'm also going to get you the biggest ROI in tax savings and they love that and it's pretty win-win so yeah that's awesome and we do see a lot of practitioners who tend to give away their services during the preparation process and they struggle with how to separate those so it's important to ask open-ended questions and then um, what are your biggest challenges what are your goals where would you like to be those kind of things and then you know laying out the case hey we probably could save you a lot of money with some advanced tax strategies. Why don't we set up a separate planning appointment um, after tax season? And a lot of leading firms will also do more education to demonstrate their financial acumen. So sending out two minute videos, small you know, uh, suggestions about how to improve tax situations and things with um, teasers, hey, if you'd like to learn more, contact us. Uh, because a lot of, I think, clients aren't aware of the services that we provide, um, aren't aware of the deep financial acumen, and maybe some of the other opportunities that are available to them. And so it's important to uh, provide that education that's ongoing without giving away necessarily all the tax strategies and things in, in that free stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, and I like what you said about um, the fact that uh, when you're having a conversation with a client, maybe you should suggest that we meet at a different time because honestly, when it's April 1st, you know, and you're giving them their tax return and you've got a hundred more yet to deliver and there are only so many hours until the 15th, you really don't, you're not in the right frame of mind to have that sort of um, more lengthy, more in-depth planning conversation with your client. Mm -hmm. So, um, so now, Jackie, you do tax prep and planning, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you separate that with your clients or how, how do those conversations go when you have a situation where you think this is a client that would be a good candidate for tax planning? Well, so like I said, every client we have is doing tax planning with us, but um, when I was first converting clients over to that from hourly back in 2016, um, I would do exactly what you just described. You know, you mentioned, hey, I see some opportunities here that could get you a 200 300% ROI in your uh, investment in us, let's meet this summer. And so we actually do an annual strategy meeting with every client. And a lot of them we do summertime right after we've you know, calmed down from April 15th, and then others we might wait until November, December. Mm -hmm. And then you really provide it as like a separate engagement to where they see that value there versus just trying to kind of throw it all together. Okay. I think we'll talk a little bit about how you might package or price that later on, but um, but I think we really kind of want to get into a little bit of meat here because uh, I asked you all to think about some of your favorite tax planning tips, and things that we could really share with the audience that they might not have thought of or might not know how to present to their clients, even if they realize that it's a, uh, an opportunity. So, um, so what do you think, Marty? Um, one of our one of the strategies I like that's getting a bad rap these days. It's on the dirty dozen. It's the captive insurance company. It has been widely abused, so the IRS is is just they're auditing that issue quite a bit. But if it's done right and if it's done for risk management purposes, it has some nice tax benefits that you have normally. And if you're saying, okay, what size client? There's vendors out there that are getting in trouble by providing this, but and just they're abusing it and they're trying to maximize the deductions on this deal. But if you do it the right way and you go with a good vendor that provides this, I mean, you're looking at, uh, in, in our practice, if, 
if you're five million dollars or above in annual revenues, then we automatically look at it, and um, we see we go through the investigation. Is this a a good planning strategy? Because I mean, you're going to get um, some several hundred thousand dollars worth of deductions in these deals. So, um, and if there is legitimate insurable risk, then you get the added benefit of a tax deduction. So it's a nice one thing that we we look at. A lot of people are scared of it, and we tell people up front, hey. When you Google a captive insurance, you're going to find that it is a uh, one of the dirty dozen, and we tell them up front, and this is why, because people are abusive of it. So, um, and in a nutshell, can you tell us what that is? So what you do is you instead of you're insuring risk, and you're paying an insurance company that you own. So let's just say um, you have three hundred thousand dollars of insurable risk premium that you get underwritten, you write a check for $300,000, you get that deduction, you also own the insurance company, and um, but that insurance company is not paying tax on that income, so you get a $300,000 deduction, you're not paying tax on it, and then with that insurance company, you're insuring risk, and then the profile is that you're hoping that there's not a lot of claims in that risk. Mm -hmm in that risk pool. So you do that for five, 10, 15 years, you have a lot of cash that's going to accumulate. And then there's some tax efficient ways to get it out of that um, insurance company that's a C-Corp. And so it, it's a way to, if you're already maximizing your retirement plan and you still have excess cash flow, it's a good way to get on top of, to even add more. Because you don't have, I mean, it's not a deal. A lot of times if you have a lot of employees and you're trying to do a defined benefit plan, it's hard to do that because everybody has to participate. So this is a way to where only the owners participate in this strategy. Okay. So Excellent. That's, a, that's one we use a lot. All right. And by the way, you can contact us if you have questions for our panel. We're uh, available on your phone at slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com. And the uh, entrance code is December CPE. So if you want to bring up any questions during our panel, feel free to do so. Jackie, you want to share a favorite tip? Oh, sure. There's just so many to pick from. But um, QBI, you know, with the new tax code, us going into kind of the second year of the QBI deduction and um, us all trying to scramble and figure out how it worked to begin with last year, there's actually some more advanced things that we can look at this year. Um, ways to actually aggregate different entities into one so that you can maximize the uh, phase out uh, limitations that occur in a QBI situation. So I love QBI. I hate the fact that I see returns coming from other accounting firm owners that just assumed a company was a specified service business, for example, and they're over the phase out threshold and there's no deduction there. Mm -hmm. That drives me nuts because there's such an awesome planning opportunity there um, to maximize that deduction. And it actually kind of ties into C-Corps and income shifting, which I know is Jim's fave. <clears throat> well, I mean, I think we can't deny that uh, the centerpiece of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was actually, you know, reducing the corporate tax rate significantly. And now between individuals at 37% and corporate at 21%, you have a 16% arbitrage or planning opportunity there. And I hear a lot of professionals say, but then you're subject to double taxation. And so I think one of the great... Uh, tax benefits is setting up a C corporation, issuing section 1202 stock, um, which can qualify for up to 100% gain if you hold that for five years after original issuance. And uh, you can have a uh, tax-free gain on that sale for up to 10 times your basis. So enormous planning opportunities there. So if you just kind of think through that, if you've got a profitable company and we've loved S-Corps and pass-throughs for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. And let's say it's passing through $250,000 a year, uh, you move that to a C-Corp and you could uh, cut down basically 16% of that. Uh, you're saving $40,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Do that for five years. Uh, that adds up to $200,000. That's a significant planning uh, gain. And then you can sell that for a basically tax-free gain. Yeah, and actually the 16% adds up way above and beyond that when you really do the math because you're then maybe qualifying someone for the QBI deduction exactly. on the personal side yeah. when they're under the personal phase outs, the 315K, which is married filing joint, um, when you maybe couldn't have done that before. So it's, it's yeah. pretty exciting. Yeah, moving that income off of the individual return someplace else gives you a lot more ability with the lower AGI to qualify for more deductions, especially the 
qualified business income deduction. Mm -hmm. And then also add some cool fringe ben benefits yes. into the mix. So yes. we'll talk about that with one of our other strategies. Okay. Yeah. All right. Marty, another one? Uh, we do a lot of cost segregation studies with our clients that are buying um, real estate or just, um, and then if you're, and it kind of falls into two buckets on what the advantage is for that. If you have some real estate in an active business and it's active income, so then you can, you can eliminate a lot of, uh, you're accelerating that depreciation and you're eliminating a lot of taxable income up front. Um, you're not getting absolute tax savings, but you're getting, you're just deferring the tax over time and you can get some real good return on that. Also, if you have a, if you're a real estate professional and your losses are fully deductible, if you have an investment property, then um, you can get some nice losses that can help you out as well. Um, and then in, under, under if it's an investment property and you're not a real estate investor, the, you don't have the big tax advantage in the deductions in the first few years, but you're just getting some tax-free um, cash, mm -hmm. and then you have, and just kind of helps the ROI on an investment. So we use that quite a bit amongst our client base. But it, it, you get really got three different buckets that um, it can apply to, and it, the results are different, but they're always usually um, they're very nice and advantageous. And that's something that we use another third-party vendor that will do that. So it's important to have a good relationship with somebody that can do that cost mm -hmm. irrigation for you that you can rely on and they can get it done timely right. because that is if you get with the wrong one and then they're oh we're gonna get it done and you're holding up returns and they don't have good service that's not a fun fun deal so if what, you what's cool though is that you can actually do it in the next year for the previous tax year still so yep. there is some ex, you know extension oh, yeah. time there oh but yeah, yeah. You, got the, you, you got you got time and then and I also would all, is ask if you're whenever you're doing this is ask the provider if they've been through audit and see if they if all their work papers will stand up audit through audit so that is an important deal mm -hmm. because there's some we've talked to that have never been audited and we started looking at their work papers and we're like there's no way I'm getting my client involved with this this group so it's a great idea but you got to have help to right. implement it so so when you mentioned using someone um, outsourced to help with this so how do you make that selection when you're looking for someone to be trusted you know a lot of it's just asking other CPAs mm -hmm. and then we're the best source of I mean just get a referral and then also going to um, just trade shows and other CPE conferences and things of that nature and just ha and just build the relationship with them and you know we CPAs we like to we like to ask questions you just build that relate and just keep kind of peppering them with questions and you'll you'll kind of figure it out so if they if they start getting vague and don't want to <laughs> don't, don't want to get into details you kind of move on so okay yeah, it's nice that captives, cost segs, there's a lot of things we can kind of go to a third party vendor for. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, like QBI and income shifting are just things you have to kind of wing, right? So um, I do want to mention I'm hosting a free CPE on CPA Academy on December 23rd. So go to their site on QBI and kind of year two traps and tricks. Mm -hmm. So that will be a helpful way to learn more information on that. Excellent. Okay, and that's cpaacademy.com, mm -hmm. or is it .org? I think it might be .org. One of those. It's two. one of those. Yeah. <laughs> it's out there somewhere. You'll find it. It's They'll one figure of the it other. Out. <laughs> All right, Jackie, you got something else for us? Sure. So um, I had the pleasure of presenting at QuickBooks Connect this year with my Intuit family here on um, year-end small employer benefit review package. So if you have a small business owner, um, you can kind of pull together three micro tax strategies to start value pricing that business without feeling super overwhelmed at how am I gonna do this, how am I gonna do that? And it kind of came down to you know hiring family members, which is an awesome thing we can all talk about here. Mm -hmm. Um, having a medical expense reimbursement plan in that entity if it's a corporation, and then having um, account, well, a corporation or hiring a spouse. There's a lot of special rules there. Um, or having an accountable plan to deduct home office expenses. Very simple concepts that um, the typical accountant might not be thinking of like, hey, I can save my client about 15K by implementing these three things this year. I charge them $3,000 for this year in review, which you can still email your clients right now and say, hey, let's take a look at this. So um, it's really exciting. And then Intuit's actually gonna have us redo that session online on December 20th. So be on session. the lookout that for that. Excellent. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, it was so great to see you there. Yeah. Um, before we continue, we should take a quick break. 
um, and do a, a bit of a, a commercial break from our sponsor into it and learn a little bit more about into it and then also when you come back we'll have the first CPE code for this session so don't go away we'll be right back Johnstown is like a village. You know, everyone sticks together here, and this town will give you an opportunity to be the best person you can be. When I first come here, I was, uh, you know, cutting grass and doing little favors, but I just wanted more. Good morning. At Carrie's Kitchen, we open our doors to all kinds, all walks of life. And when we cook, we cook with love. Really good, nice and sweet. We cook like we're cooking for our families. We do more to get more. Looking good. I'm excited for Intuit coming in, giving us the little push that we need to get financially stable. A lot of our children were leaving Johnstown, but a lot of them are staying now because of all the opportunities and the growth that's happening right now. I try to teach the children about right, ready? respect, yeah, yeah. money management, some things that I didn't know about when I was younger, but I'm learning that it's very valuable. If you invest in our children, you invest in, in, in Johnstown, it comes back tenfold. So prosperity for me is community and people getting together. Where do you find yourself financially? And if everyone gets the, the paying forward type of mentality, this town will show the world how it's supposed to be done. Welcome back, and please look at the bottom of your screen. You should see the first CPE code for this session. You want to be sure to write that down and save it, uh, along with the others that we'll give you during this session that will entitle you to your CPE credit for this session. And before we go down to Jim, Marty was thinking during the break of some things he wanted to add to the conversation we were having a moment before. So uh, what do you think, Marty? Yeah, so uh, with this tax planning concept that we're talking about, our clients are used to tax prep. And if you go and you say, I have these planning opportunities, like you said, the five, they say, I'm going to save you fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. They like that, but then they start saying, is this only up and up? What's <laughs> really going on here? I'm used to just paying my tax. I've been paying it this way for 10, 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we do is we make sure we try to limit it to three and we make it easy to understand. Three clients. Or, or three, strategy. three strategy. Three, three strategy. strategies that are easy to understand and we spend a lot of time educating clients on this so they understand, they have confidence in what they're doing because they're going to go to their spouse and they're, they're well, why do we have all this money? Well, Marty <laughs> told us to do this and I want them to be able to, number one, be able to talk, communicate with their spouse but then it's a great marketing opportunity because if they understand what we've done, they're going to go to a party. They're going to do. They're going to talk to other business owners, and they're going to say, "Man, I just saved a bunch of money." And then, well, how'd you do it? Well, then they have a working knowledge, a, mm -hmm. a high level, and they can explain it to their friend that's a business owner. And then, next thing they know, hey, I need to talk to Marty. And then you get a phone call. So it's a good marketing. It it seems like this is going to take a lot of time to explain to this client about this tax strategy, but you're really marketing, and it really helps kind of get that snowball going going on this and it'll give you confidence in what you're doing. So Yeah, there's really like a couple different phases or maybe even more than two mm -hmm. phases in tax planning, right? Yeah. So like phase one can be about um, these you know, three smaller concepts where you're not paying us this tremendous fee up front mm -hmm. um, and you can earn that trust, right? Mm -hmm. And then phase two, you can charge a new implementation fee to start getting with, you know, the big dogs, you know? So depending on what strategies mm -hmm. you know or don't know. Yep. So yep. yeah, it's fun. Yeah. yeah, and I think too, um, because this is different for a lot of practitioners, um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is a great sort of entry point or excuse, hey, because taxes um, have changed so much, we're changing our practice, we're going to focus more on leading with tax planning, leading with more advanced strategy, really to help you reach your long-term goals. And so I think framing it up, using the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is perfectly okay. Um, a lot of things, a lot of leading firms too will create a tax strategy checklist. Um, so our traditional 
tax planning engagements. We're all around, get a whole bunch of information together, put it in a tax planner and come up with new estimates. Um, leading firms have changed that. They're more about defining their strategies, putting it in a checklist, even naming those strategies. When you put a creative name on it, it helps mm -hmm. you know, familiarize, educate your staff, your team. You can talk about it more familiar um, and really begin to educate, like Marty said, your clients and bring them along and let them know that your value is really continually looking forward, working on long-term goals, wealth building goals, tax strategy goals, and not just that preparation process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. All right, so Jim, have you got another tip for us? Ooh, um, you know, one of the ones I think, and this, is, this one's good for tax planning, is as practitioners, we have enormous financial acumen, and I think um, we have these great trusted relationships, but sometimes we under leverage our ability to be the quarterback and bringing in all the right experts. And, as our clients are aging, as they're boomers, they've got a lot of money in retirement accounts, they've got money in real estate, they've got money in taxable accounts. It's a great opportunity for you as an advisor to coordinate the investment strategies and putting uh, the right income types in the right accounts. So for instance, if you have a day trader and that day trader is creating lots of short-term gains, uh, maybe options, things like that, that uh, can trigger a lot of ordinary income, maybe you want to encourage them to move that into uh, their IRA account. They may want to be more aggressive with their Roth IRA accounts since those are going to be tax free down the road. Maybe focus your taxable accounts on more of your long term capital investments that get better tax treatment today, get a step up in basis maybe down the road. So thinking about coordinating all the different assets in the investment strategy to put the uh, right income into the right buckets to best protect um, on, that, on that tax strategy. Yeah, definitely. I think self-directed IRAs, self-directed solo 401ks or general 401ks are a great asset to talk about with your clients. Um, another aspect that you can add on top of that for a strategy would be a defined benefit plan, which those have been around for ages, but for one reason or another, a lot of people don't feel like they have access to it in a small business environment. Um, and a little secret sauce that I found the last couple years just going to tax strategy conferences and stuff is something called a 401h plan. And and it actually lets you set aside 25% of what you're putting in that defined benefit plan each year into a completely tax-free medical retirement savings account. And so it's like a supercharged Roth component. And so we interviewed, when you ask, how do you find these vendors to help you? I interviewed probably 15 different vendors to find the right third-party mm -hmm. actuary that could do this 401H component for me. And it's kind of, you know, just a little thing that we do at Meyer Tax that really helps us shine. Sounds very cool. So, Jim, I'm going to put you on the spot for a minute and go back to you for a minute because I, I, it's sort of on the spot, but I know you've written about this, and I think this is something that impacts taxpayers everywhere, and that is the change in employee business expenses that occurred last year um, with the loss of that deduction for the most part, or is it a loss? So certainly, um, you know, losing 2% itemized deductions was, um, could be a loss, uh, but by structuring a reimbursement plan through your employer, um, you could still preserve those as deductions um, and then maybe even take advantage of that uh, standard deduction, which is significantly higher. Um, and it also provides great planning opportunities to think about bunching deductions from one year to the next. So you may want to think about um, creating that reimbursement plan to take care of those previous uh, 2% itemized deductions, um, unreimbursed employee business expenses. Um, think about bunching some of your charitable contributions in one year. Um, and there's some creative things that you can do even using like a, a donor uh, directed charitable account. Um, and those are not hard to set up. It's not like setting up an entire foundation. Um, and you as a advisor can add a lot of value in helping uh, do the uh, estimates on that and then helping them, uh, reminding them when to make those donations, when to bunch. Maybe you uh, take the standard in even years, take the itemized in odd years, things like that. Uh, so those are some ideas, some planning ideas. Okay. 
Yeah, so that official term of having the employer reimburse is the accountable plan that we mentioned earlier. And there's really not a whole lot of structure to that. I mean, when you're first hearing about these things, I don't know about y'all, but I thought, well, where's the official document here? Or what like guidance do I have to follow? And yeah, there's guidance. But I mean, it's literally just like a Word document you throw together that says we have an accountable plan in our office. So it's not like you're paying thousands of dollars to you know implement these strategies. Like in Corporation right, exactly, right. exactly, yeah. And then the donor advised fund, oh man, those are amazing because you're able to, um, let's say you have a big sales event one year and you're like, you know what, I can put 100K into um, charitable endeavors, but I'm not sure which ones yet. And so on 1231 of 19 this year, you could actually set up a donor advised fund with Fidelity, which takes about three minutes online and get that whole 100K deduction up front and then Put it out to any charities that you want over the next 10, 15, whatever years. There's no limitation there. Yeah. All right. Um, don't forget that you can reach us on slido.com if you'd like to present some of your questions to our speakers. It's slido.com, and the uh, entrance code is December CPE. So, Marty, have you got some other tips for us? Uh, one of the things that we do is just hiring your family and then being able to hire your spouse, hire your children. Um, one of the things with hiring the spouse is just if you have a 401k, it allows you to then uh, max out the employee contribution and then you can put an employer contribution on there for your spouse. Um, hiring your children, it, it's a good way to um, put some money into, let them work and then understand the value of a dollar. That's not a tax issue, but that's another <laughs> issue. But right. um, being able to have that, they can you can put it, if it's earned income, you're not worried about the kitty tax, and being able to then put money aside. And it could um, for college or spending money and things of that nature. Um, kind of the derivative of that, if you em employ your family and you're going on a business and a pleasure trip, well now you took employees with you. You're, they're not really family, they're, employees now so it allows some deductibility nice. around that so th that's one of the things that we, we do and, and that's on a case-by-case -case basis mm -hmm. on how uh, how we advise that but we always want to make sure can we take advantage of hiring the spouse and the family so excellent Y'all want to take that to the next level with let's, a strategy? Let's okay. take it. So <laughs> let's combine everything that we just talked about here. So we could actually form a family limited partnership for maybe someone that does investing for a living. And that becomes ordinary pass-through income or loss to the parents and add the kids in, right, to start transitioning the wealth um, during their lifetime. And then have a management company involved, which is a C-Corp. And so the FLP can pay that C-Corp, and you get all kinds of fun benefits out of that. And then have a little family meeting every quarter or so to talk about what is our family office doing here. Um, let's research these different stocks that are involved. I have clients that assign different research projects to their kids all the time. Mm. And um, it works out really well. And it really does help them in that other side yeah. of things where the kids are getting involved and getting mm -hmm. into work. And that's such a concern for all of us as parents, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that. By the way, I think that's awesome. I have three kids who are all in their 20s and um, they're children of an accountant and they have peers who don't know how to do budgeting. And they literally, my three kids end up teaching their peers, roommates and friends and stuff, how to do budgeting because a lot of kids do grow up these days without the financial literacy that they really need to operate in the world. And, and um, certainly most of them are going to be involved in self-employment or some type of um, business that they're running, uh, just if you look at the demographics and things over time. So financial literacy and teaching those budgeting skills is awesome for that younger generation and really, you know, increases your value as an advisor. So love that strategy. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. We'll yeah, just pat ourselves on go. the back. <laughs> there you go. All right, why don't we take a second break right now and do uh, another word from our sponsor into it, and then we'll see our second CPE code when you come back from break. Someone once told me that if you don't tell your story, someone else will, and you may not like how they tell it. 
Historically, this region was in coal mining and the railroad industry. Over the years, with the decline of coal, the city has been in decline itself. But one of the reasons that Rodney and I stayed in Bluefield is to help our community. And since the announcement of Intuit coming to Bluefield, there is a buzz and excitement that you can feel. Bluefield now has a greater potential to grow and prosper. I really didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, but I knew I wanted to be a helper in some kind of way. With this job, I'm able to give back to my community on the marketing side. Hi, there we go. I get really inspired by our business owners. They come in every single day wanting to achieve their dream. Look, everyone. I get to see their personality and their products. There you go. Bright colors, the way that they decorate their shops. When you see <laughs> what they want to get out of their business, you kind of have a sense of pride. You did a great job with those. I think that's just like the coolest part about my job, seeing things come alive. How you doing, man? Doing good, man. And I think it's so important for everyone to tell their story, to express their passions, their interests. We want to take ownership in the place that we live. Bluefield won't be the same as it used to be. I think we need to honor our past, but also look to our future. And I'm very excited to be a part of Bluefield's story. Welcome back, and please look at the bottom of your screen and write down the second CPE code for this session and save that along with the first one that you've already got. And uh, there'll be one more before we finish. Also, don't forget you can reach us. Uh, we prefer, prefer you do it on your phone so that you don't uh, disrupt your screen display, but you can reach us at slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and the entrance code is December CPE, so if you'd like to ask us any questions on the panel, please feel free to do so. But first, we're going to do a couple more tips um, and then move into a little bit different discussion about how to incorporate this into your practice. So what do you think? Who's got their favorite tip they want to they, share? It's not a specific tip, but it's a discussion point of when you have your clients, and especially with the, the new QBI rules, mm -hmm. is sitting down and saying, all right, why are you doing this? What's the long-term plan? And talking about entity selection. And are you in the right entity? Because with a lot of the, I mean, there's some things that have changed recently with the new tax code that might, depending on what the long-term goal is, are you, do you need to look at changing the entity? And I think that's a, uh, a discussion that needs to be revisited a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, there's no specific strategy there, but I think just understanding why they're doing what they're doing. And then one of the things that we see a lot with new clients coming in is, if you're an S Corp, is having the right compensation. I mean, a lot of people, um, they just don't get that right. And I think there's sort of, there's a, a, a feeling out in the marketplace that among people who don't know a lot about taxes that if you become an S Corp, then you don't have to pay self-employment tax right. on your income anymore. Right. Um, and I think that's, yes. I don't know how that misleading message got out there, but it's definitely out there front and center. Yes, because we see when we get a new client, we see it on both ends. We either see them, they're paying 100% of their profits via W-2 right. or they're paying nothing. Yeah. And there's, there's like, hold on, you got to have a reasonable compensation. Yeah. So that's yeah. something that is something you can look at. Mm -hmm. So, For sure. Yeah, definitely. It's surprising how many people overpay themselves yes. through their companies, not just underpaying to try to avoid payroll taxes. Mm -hmm. I think another kind of interesting um, tax planning strategy around the new tax code right now is um, qualified opportunity zones. So that's the ability to um, reinvest any kind of cap gains that you have, whether it's stock or, um, you know, a building or whatever. Um, into these qualified opportunity zones of real estate. Well, what's funny is that it was based on, I think like 2008 guidelines from the government of zones in the US that were struggling. Mm -hmm. And it's like right next door stuff. Mm -hmm. Like in DFW, it's Hearst, yep. Arlington. Yep. There's um, a place, some, I looked into like somewhere by Beaver Creek in Colorado yeah. for someone's ski <laughs> <Yeah>. home. <laughs> it's like Avon or something that qualifies. So it's a really interesting opportunity, so to speak, because it starts 
deferring your capital gains and then actually eliminating up to 15%. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that people seem to have a problem with, and, and Marty, you've done a few of these, um, is that it takes seven to 10 years before yes. it starts to reduce those gains. Yes. But there's also some like depreciation recapture stuff that can mm -hmm. be a benefit to that yep. too. And the one thing I've had, th we've had three clients that have did it this past year. And the one thing, and I've had, we had several others that wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. The thing that we learned is you want to get, because there's, it's a very complex issue and there's a lot of things that you need to do right and wrong, is get, get into, a, invest through a fund and then like we were talking about earlier, you want to talk and you want to interview the people, the fund managers, mm -hmm. to make sure they have the background to understand. Because if you if you skip a beat on this deal and don't cross the the right T and dot the right I, you could just you can mess this deal up. And so it's very complex. So you want to get with someone that can educate, um, because it's not a simple deal like you you talked about. And um, so you know what you're investing in, and been ha and there's several that I've gotten to know that. Luckily, that I'm gonna start referring people to, but there's a lot of just like anything else. There's a lot of fly-by-night folks that are trying to capitalize on this, but it's a it can be a great, great opportunity for someone that doesn't need the money. Mm -hmm. When you say, I mean, it's, oh yeah, yeah, for sure, it's just a tax tax strategy. And I'm gonna have to get that vendor from yeah. you off off, off camera yeah, because well. I've been interviewing and interviewing because yeah. you want to actually find a return on investment in the investment itself yep. other than just the tax deferral or savings, yep. right? Mm -hmm. yep. And so that is hard to find because everyone jumped on that bandwagon when it first came out last mm -hmm. year. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about uh, about your practices, or Jim, you, you used to be in practice, you're into it now, but still heavily into taxes, but I'd like to get some perspective for our audience on the different ways a, a tax planning practice can evolve. Okay. So, um, Jim, you want to start by telling us just basically what you were doing before you went into it? Sure. Um, I spent a dozen years as a partner in an East Texas firm. We did lots of oil and gas tax. Um, okay. I've actually forgotten more about oil and gas tax <laughs> since I've been into it than I ever knew. That's probably a good um, thing. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, we were, we were very good uh, and did some really great work. Um, but uh, love doing what I do at Intuit, and I learn a lot of best practices from leading firms today. And uh, it's been a lot of fun to see how leading firms are really shifting their focus and their value proposition for their clients uh, to focus more on the tax strategy, to focus on uh, what's really important for their clients, and that is whatever their long-term goals are. Maybe it's money, maybe it's you know stop working, spending more time with the family, doing mission work, giving more. There are lots of things that our clients have hopes and dreams and goals for. They all have different things. But when we go to these leading firms and we see some of the things that they're doing to focus on tax strategy, it really is transformational. It's transformational for the firm. Um, it's transformational for the practitioners and their life. Uh, they're not just cranking out as many returns and, and you know taking nine months to do a tax return. Um, it really is a very different experience. They're more engaged on a more casual basis uh, throughout the year. It's more relational, um, and it's just a much stronger um, experience for the clients. So it's, it's a lot of fun to see. Excellent. Jackie, you wanna talk about your practice? Sure, so yeah, I, um, I went to my business coach back in 2016, Chuck Bauer here in Dallas, and I said, you know, my practice is fine. You know, we're making money. Um, the clients seemed decently happy. We were kind of more hourly or fixed fee based at the time. But I don't really want to do another tax busy season like the one I just did. And so he asked me some very important questions. You know, which of your clients do you love working with and why? And so based on that, I was able to redevelop out a value proposition and packages and value pricing around my favorite clientele, which was awesome. And so I ended up selling off 60% of my client base, which, you know, don't be like, shame on you, Jackie Meyer, because it actually gives you a lot more control when you're selling the clients to someone that you've hand selected for them than just firing them. Uh, a mm -hmm. client. And mm -hmm. so I have a really different perspective on that than what a lot of accounting firm owners do. And then, you know, we tripled our revenues and 
Um, my time has just every year gone down more and more and more. And when Jim says transformational, I mean, that's the understatement of the year because it's just life altering. And I can't stress enough how important it is for people if they want that time back, if they want to give better value and services their clients, if they want, if they really care about people, you know, this is the way to go. Tax yeah. strategies is the easiest way to show a return on investment to clients. Mm -hmm. And were you just straight tax prep before you made that transition? No, we actually did tax strategies, but it was rolled into, oh yeah, let's talk about your 1040, here's some ideas. Um, I always really enjoyed tax strategies and the idea of being kind of your client's detective and, and figuring that stuff out. Um, but this was a, you know, a big change to be like, look, we're, we're converting over to value price packages and um, you know, we're changing our procedures, we're changing the way that we do every Thing with our clients at our firm and um, most clients were just so thrilled I think I maybe had one that well one that I fired that wasn't happy <laughs> but everyone else was really ecstatic <laughs> yeah. excellent okay and Marty what's your story so I was um, I was doing outsourced CFO work and then they would be asking me to review their tax returns and then so I had we had about 10 clients I had three clients that sold within a six-month period 80% of my revenue. And so, but my client's like, you know what, you need to get in this tax planning business. I'm like, I don't know how to do a tax return. I was like, I was, when I started in public camp, they kicked me out of the tax department because they said I talked too much and I blew all the budgets. So they're like, well, hey, well, we, you can see, you understand this tax stuff. I was like, well, whatever. So they said, well, go find somebody to do some returns. And he says, and just go and focus on, you can figure this out. So I went and talked to some folks and I said, all right, we're going to start with doing, ta we do initial tax planning engagements to where we review. So I, I started out with zero and I just said, I'm gonna look at you and I'm like, can I save you money? If I can, there's an engagement. And then we put everybody on a, um, on an annual, fee, on annual fee, we bill them monthly, direct draft on the first. And so I just built it one by one and I um, just went and took a bunch of people to lunch, telling them what we did and kind of grew from that. And so what we did is, you know, I have a lot of folks that have firms our size that do three and four times the amount of tax returns that we do, but their revenues are smaller than what we do. And then, um, so kind of what my model is, I can handle 100 client relationships, and that's what we cap it at. And then so, and then everybody is on a um, retainer, and then it just al allows us to have the time to talk and to be available. And so, and one of the important thing to me was I was not gonna go into the tax department like I saw at PwC and those guys killing themselves mm -hmm. 80 hours a week. I like going spring snow skiing. So I take my kids spring snow skiing every year. We go to Colorado and it's awesome. And then I knew I had to build a business that would allow me to do that. Cause I only have 12 spring breaks. So mm -hmm. they don't. Yeah. All right, um, we're gonna take one more quick break um, hear a little bit more from our sponsor into it. We'll have one more CPE code when we come back and then we'll wrap this up with a few questions I think about uh, pricing and how you guys structure that. So be right back. I've always known that I've liked helping people. So that was a pretty good nap, wasn't it? But I didn't exactly know how to go about it. When the recession came through here, there weren't really a lot of options around. I could either work in a service industry or you could try to get a job in the mines. My grandfather was a coal miner and there's this misconception that that's what you have to do if you're from here. But when Intuit came in to the community, it opened up all these jobs. At this job, I train new hires. Your guys' role is to make sure they're having the best experience with Intuit. We've got close to a thousand people that work here, which when you've got a county as small as ours, it seems like everyone works here. It's nice to be able to know what I'm doing is making a difference. Those one-to-one -one interactions that I have every single day, that's a huge piece of it. Because of that human connection, because of those relationships, people are learning skills that they can use to better themselves and the community around us. 
I think one of the keys to prosperity in the area is people going out and chasing those dreams and revitalizing the economy here. Not only am I excited to be able to make positive changes in the community now, but I also want to set up the next generation for success. I think that's what prosperity means for us and WISE. Welcome back. Uh, be sure to take down the CPE code that's on the bottom of your screen. Write that down with the other two codes that you have, and you'll use that when you're finished with all your sessions today. Uh, to, and you'll click the CPE tab at the top of our screen, and then you can use those, all of those codes to get your CPE credits. Um, before we wrap up today, I'd like to talk a little bit with uh, Marty and Jackie about their pricing structures, which is a little bit different for, for each firm. And so if you're thinking of moving from a straight tax prep practice to something that's more uh, reflective of the skills you may have that you think your clients are going to appreciate more, you may want to rethink your pricing structure as well. So um, Marty, how do you price your services? Okay. So um, and kinda, I kind of take a different uh, approach when you say you're the most expensive um, CPA, I, I always say I'm going to be the cheapest because oh, what I'm going to do, I said, free, right? yes, I said, <laughs> because you might pay me up front, but you're going to get a nice return. So yeah. the way we do this is we have, I talked about the initial planning engagement mm -hmm. and there's a fee related to there. So normally what we do is we'll say, for instance, if, if you, we're going to save you um, $20,000, we can't do a percentage or anything like that, but normally that's a five to six thousand dollar engagement so we're saying okay you're going to pay me five to six thousand dollars whatever the number is for twenty thousand dollars you're going to save every year so that's a huge and so and if you want us to continue to do that we will say here's an annual tax fee that we're going to charge you and what that's going to include is it's going to include your prep um, of your return we're going to be uh, unlimited phone calls and emails and then we're going to um, check in with you in the summer check in with you in the fall and um, just make sure everything's everything's good, and we give them a fee, and we um, they sign the engagement letter, and then we just draft, we divide that fee by 12, draft it on the first of the month, and it allows us to have year-round cash flow. And so it's kind of weird. Most CPAs love tax season because it's hey, I get all this money. I, tax season is like we actually have to work. <laughs> I mean, like, so we're working hard and we're making the same as we do the rest of the year. So, but I'll trade the three months of working hard for the other nine nice. any day of the week. So that's how we do it. Okay. Jackie, how do you do it? Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, so we actually cap out at about 100 clients as well, and um, our average billing is about $12,000 per client per year on a monthly basis. We ACH up front every mm. month, just like you do. Um, and so a client will pay us an initial implementation or onboarding fee. Um, that really is composed of looking at what are kind of the one-time big benefits they're getting up front. Um, and then also a monthly maintenance fee to continue with the compliance work. Um, we offer audit, IRS audit protection in our top package, things like that. So um, it's actually kind of similar to your mm -hmm. model and it works. It does. Right? It does. Yeah. And not everyone's going to say yes. I mean, we have, I don't know about for you, is like people are like, where are these clients going to come from? And we're blessed. We're in a great market. Yeah. I mean, are. it is one. Th and so, I mean, I literally t say no to eight out of 10 leads because mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, just because we're in a great market and we know there's going to be someone else coming and not, so eight out of 10 people that, see our ad or see something come to us and they're just not a fit and that's what we tell them is like we want to make sure you're a fit and one of the things is that we as CPAs we don't want to be the mean guy or mean person you want to get a network of folks you can refer to and it, then all the people in your community all the other CPAs love you because like you're referring me all this business they love it right. and then and I always tell these folks I get a lot of referrals from people I send to other folks because they're like, hey, Marty sat, I mean, I sat and talked to him for 30 minutes. Okay, it's 30 minutes. And I talked to him, I listened to him, I gave him some advice, and then they might know somebody that will refer. And then, I mean, when you get a referral, I mean, that's slam dunk. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's easy to close and you move on down the road. Nice. Yeah, definitely. It is about saying no and having boundaries, right? Yes. You need to have in mind, you know, what is that client that you want to work with and who you don't? And then maybe even have 
um, and the office manager or your assistant helping kind of field the rest. Because that 30 minutes that, well, you're you're a social guy, so yeah. you probably like meeting with people. Yeah. I'm an introvert. Yeah. So I'd rather be doing like behind the scenes, tech strategies and stuff. So, you know, you could save that 30 minutes with your office manager kind of uh, pre-qualifying your leads and then maybe spending it towards higher value work like um, strategizing, converting clients that you see that biggest ROI in. Mm -hmm. And we often hear from firms, hey, if I was starting out, I'd love to do that, and that makes sense. But I have legacy clients, I have a legacy firm, and I don't know how to do that. Um, and the truth is, you know, it's your practice. You can change how you invoice. You can change your value proposition any day. Um, you're underselling by just putting, hey, doing a 1040 tax return on an invoice, and that's what your value is. What we find is, like, like you, all the leading firms that have moved to tax strategy have updated their business model, and they include a lot more in terms of what they're communicating, mm -hmm. their value is to customers. Um, an easy way to do it is just uh, a lot of people start with three packages of bundled services that includes uh, a lot of different services, things like unlimited phone calls, emails, things mm -hmm. like that, as well as um, advanced tax strategies. And maybe it's basic tax planning in the first one, more advanced over here. Um, but just saying, hey, we're changing our model, here's our new packages, mm -hmm. and beginning to mm -hmm. start that change with your, your existing clients. Yep. I think rolling it out one or two at a time and you know, testing the waters and seeing how you feel about making that kind of a price presentation sure. yes. compared to what you've done in the past is an easy way to work your way into it. Well, I actually told my first client that I pitched, you're my guinea pig client mm -hmm. for this new package. And it was someone that I knew trusted me, already loved me to death because I saved him like 150K on an amended return that he had really screwed up himself. <laughs> and so, you know, I was like, just help walk Let's walk through this together, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What makes sense about the packages? What doesn't? And you know, he's still a client today, and everything's good. It really helped, you know, give the confidence that was needed to get yeah. it done. Mm -hmm. and, and on that is, I mean, start low. Start with a number you're comfortable with, because yes, you're going to increase your fee, and keep going up every time mm -hmm. <laughs> until they start saying no. Because yeah. if they don't start saying no, then you're not charging enough. <laughs> and so that that's how you, and, and that is different for every market, and that's different for every practitioner as to what is their number, what mm -hmm. people willing to pay you. So just take it one at a time. And don't be afraid to try it. Launch and learn. It's going to be wrong the first time. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to adjust it. Three yeah. months, six months, a year down the road, you're going to make some changes. And that's what we do. We practice. We practice on our clients. We learn. We adjust. Mm -hmm. We've also seen that most leading firms who've gone down this path end up niching more. So they're passionate about something. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves some type of client, whether they're doctors or dentists or pharmacies or construction or something. And most of these leading firms do tend to find a niche type client and sort of focus in on them and come up with just some amazingly brilliant tax strategies and then make that repeatable. Mm -hmm. yep. Excellent. So um, before we go, I want to mention that all attendees, uh, everyone who registered for this conference after the conference is over receive something that we call a digital, digital tote bag, which is uh, an email a PDF document that includes information from all of our sponsors and also our speakers are welcome to enter information into that tote bag. And our speakers here have put together a collection of resources for you specifically relating to evolving your tax practice into tax planning and how to do that and how to price it. There's some great resources there. So be sure to look for that. I think it comes out in about a week to 10 days after this conference, um, but look for that in your email. So that'll be included. Uh, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look back. Yeah. All right. Well, excellent. Thank you all so much. And thank you all for attending this session. Don't go away. We have an excellent session coming up next. And we will see you in about five minutes after we just change up the set. And we'll be right back. <laughs>